Amen. You can have a seat, brothers and sisters. Thank you so much. Uh, let me clarify something immediately. These sacks are not up here as against what popular belief is to keep me from falling off the stage. <laughs> it's an opportunity for us to continue in worship. Because as brothers and sisters in Christ, we have the ability to worship in more than just music, in more than just song. We worship God and give Him glory by giving of ourselves. And what you see in front of you is a representation of some giving that you as a family of believers have done through Partners in Hope toward the Easter opportunity to distribute bags of food, each one of these representing a meal. Um, I looked around the building and did a quick count. There are at least 50 of these that you have provided to... 80, I apologize, see, I, I, it was a quick count, I apologize, it's a, God, maybe we should pray and see if we can multiply it again, no, 80, that is awesome, what we want to do is make sure that as an act of worship, we dedicate this to Jesus Christ, because the difference, you know, some people say, what's the difference between the United Way and a church, what's the difference between a social service and a church, answer, we meet needs to point to the real answer to all needs. Yes? So we want to pray that these opportunities, as persons come through Partners in Hope and they receive this Easter meal, we want that to be an open door that they'll know that Jesus does love them and does care and there is someone out there that they can turn to. So will you pray with me for just a moment as we worship God and bless this gift to Him. Holy Spirit, Mighty God, Jesus, we come to you this morning and we thank you for the privilege of service, the privilege of worship, that we don't just worship in song and in our heads, but we worship with our heart and our hands as well. And it's this act of worship that we dedicate you for, to you this morning. We ask that you would take each one of these grocery gifts and use it to open the hearts of those who need to know that you're there and you care. Would you do that this Easter? Let this action that we take open doorways to awareness of your love and your desire to meet people and meet their real needs, the ones that last forever. Do that for us, Lord, and we will give you the glory. And now, Lord, as we move on to listen and look into your word together, I pray that the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts will be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and my Redeemer. Amen. Amen. Today marks the beginning of what traditional Christian groups refer to as Holy Week. Today is Palm Sunday, and then we move through the week following the events of Jesus and his disciples on that fateful week in Jerusalem as they move toward Monday, Thursday, the Lord's Supper and the betrayal, and then Good Friday, the crucifixion of Jesus and his burial, and then on to next Sunday... The joyful stone rolled away victory moment where Jesus rises from the dead to declare, that's done, death has been defeated, and our hope is secured. Now those moments in Holy Week provide artists with no end of images and metaphors to be able to build and celebrate. You can think of uh, the empty tomb and how many artists have found ways to, to speak to that in, in sculpture, in um, in painting, in music. Uh, you can think of Jesus at the Garden of Gethsemane and how that's been an inspiration to those who are thinking of how to express God's heart in art. Uh, you can think of the opportunities that come as Jesus is arrested and betrayed and some persons have sought to express their heart through expressing that in art. But certainly, one of the most common artistic focus moments in this whole week is the Last Supper. So I brought some pictures to run as we talk about it a little bit. Whether it's ancient anonymous artists painting on the side of uh, ancient churches that have been excavated in archaeology, or maybe it's da Vinci and Scolari and the famous artists who paint this portrait of the Last Supper. Or maybe it's the people that come in the 1800s and paint this situation with 18th century costumes in 18th century rooms. Or maybe it's this kind of picture where you see another setting. Each artist is putting their own setting around the table with these faces and Jesus at the center. Even on to this uh, picture, I believe. Yeah, there it is. Coming out of a recent movie. It fascinates.
fascinates artists. It fascinates people to portray this event of these committed brothers, this band of brothers with Jesus at the center having this incredible meal together. And I want us to focus in on that as well today because that account is with us in Luke 22. And as we look into Luke 22, I want to suggest the fascination has to do with the amazing contrast that this event presents to us. So let's put this next slide up if you would. There it is. The Last Supper chapter is an extraordinary account of a family meal among dear friends bookended by betrayal. Multiple betrayal. We're going to take a look at a meal where Jesus says, I've longed to have this with you, my, my closest friends, my closest brothers. I want to bring you around this table and express my love for you. And at the same time, this account is going to show how those brothers will turn their backs on Jesus again and again and again in this chapter. What an amazing contrast. It's worth exploring the faces around that table. So as we look at the theme of faces in the crowd, I want you to move with me around the faces of that table at the Last Supper meal and look into the eyes of those that are there. And I want you to begin with one who doesn't show up in the paintings, but he's there. And you can fill it in. The evil one who is negotiating to find the price you will accept to renounce your commitment. You say, well, Jeff, I've never seen a Last Supper painting where the devil's been leaning over Thomas's shoulder. Okay, I understand. You never see his face, but we know he's there because Jesus tells us he's there. In the middle of Luke 22, as he's serving this meal and they're sharing it together, we have this incredible statement that Jesus makes to Peter, but he uses his name Simon. 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 Satan is asked to sift all of you as wheat. You have to recognize, brothers and sisters, that behind that picture of friends together at a meal, the evil one is lurking. He's moving around the room looking for an opening. He's moving around the room among those who claim to be committed to him. And he's poking to see if there's a price he can find that will cause them to turn that will cause them to betray, that will cause them to give up the hope they have and renounce this Jesus they claim to follow. He's always lurking in the background, roaming like a roaring lion, says one New Testament writer. Another one says he's a thief, Jesus says, coming to steal and kill and destroy. And he's always checking to see, what does it mean? What do I need to do to buy you off? What do I need to do to get you to turn your back? So as he's lurking around in that room, even though we don't see his face, you know he's there. And it's worth evaluating whether, and I believe indeed it is, that he still lurks around. Looking for those who may have a price that he can buy them off for and buy them off with. Let's turn away from him for a moment and go to a face that the minute you say the name, it lives in infamy. It's the face of Judas. You see, Judas is at that meal. At least for part of it, as the gospel writers seem to suggest, Judas is sitting at this band of brothers committed. Oh, I want to share this with you, says Jesus. Dinner. He's been invited to the table. And yet we're told in Luke 22 to set the scene. Before he goes to this meal, he's already been bought. Take a look. Now the festival of unleavened bread called the Passover was approaching and the chief priests and the teachers of the law were looking for some way to get rid of Jesus for they were afraid of the people. Then Satan entered Judas. Read that. Satan offered him a deal he couldn't refuse. So before you're too hard on Judas, Satan never offered you a deal? 
Then Satan entered Judas called Iscariot, one of the twelve, and Judas went to the chief priests and the officers of the temple guard and discussed with them how he might betray Jesus. And they were delighted and agreed to give him money. Thirty pieces of silver, we're told in another gospel. We know how much he gets. And all of us go, yeah, Judas, traitor. All of us turn away and go, yeah, what a loser. Before you turn away so fast, recognize this. It isn't quite as obvious to the other disciples around the table that he's such a loser. In fact, to the very end, they aren't even sure who it's going to be who betrays them. Let me show you in the middle of Luke. Chapter 22, but the hand, this is Jesus, but the hand of him who is going to betray me is with mine on the table. The son of man will go as it has been decreed, but woe to that man who betrays him. And they began to question among themselves, which of them might do this? What I want you to notice is they don't all zip their eyes to Judas and go, yep, there's the loser. <laughs> That's obvious. You have to ask a really hard question before you move away from the face of Judas. What is it that causes someone who has been called by Jesus, who has walked with him for three plus years, who has seen Jesus multiply a happy meal into food for thousands of people and helped serve it, one who was there at the tomb of Lazarus when the mummy dude comes out alive, who is there when they're sent out as the 12 with an empowerment when Jesus says, I want you to go. And they come back going, whoa, what we have seen and accomplished. And Jesus says, I've seen Satan fall from heaven like lightning. What an incredible ministry opportunity and moment. He's been with Jesus. He's been there throughout. He's seen it all. What causes someone who is that close to betray. We can make some guesses. We know that Judas was part of the political party of zealots. Scripture tells us that. The zealots were revolutionaries in Jesus' day who believed that you had to get the Romans out of Judea and if you had to overthrow them by violence, that was okay. One way or the other, the Jews needed to have their independence. Perhaps Judas saw in Jesus an answer to that, a way to accomplish the ends that everybody knew needed to happen anyway. And don't forget, today is Palm Sunday, right? Let's go to that site. Just four days before this event, they have entered into Jerusalem with palms being thrown on the ground. And don't miss this. Palms are often considered to be signs of peace. Don't forget Palms were also signs of Jewish nationalism. Were you aware that coins printed during the time of Jesus in Judea had on the back palm branches? Why do we put eagles on the back of some of our coins, brothers and sisters, as Americans? Just a little reminder, just a little hint to everybody of our national pride. Brothers and sisters, as those palms are being thrown down, you can imagine Judas walking going, this is it, this is it, it's finally going to happen. Jesus is going to sweep into this place and he's going to run the Romans out of here and he's going to establish his Messiah kingdom. Yes, it's finally going to happen the way I've always known it was going to. But then Monday happens and it doesn't happen. And then Tuesday happens and it doesn't happen. And Wednesday happens and it doesn't happen. And I wonder if on Thursday, Judas said, I'm sick of this. I'm sick of the fact that, that I'm always wanting Jesus to do something. He's never willing to do it. <clears throat> you ever been there? I'm sick of this. He never comes through for me. He never does this. I can help him. That's what I'm going to do. I'm going to help him. I'm going to go turn him in. And then when the whole thing comes down in a crash, he'll have to rise up. He'll have to fight back. I can make this happen. Maybe, maybe that's it. Maybe he's one of those people who just got tired of waiting to, for Jesus to do it his way and decided, I'm going to do this my way. Not you, but do you know Christians who might do that now and then? Or maybe it was just simple greed. Because we know from the scriptures that although 
all of the disciples trusted him so much they made him treasurer. Apparently, every now and then, Judas was not above skimming a little off the top. The Gospels tell us that every now and then he would steal from the money back. So could it be possible that maybe part of this is that Judas finally said, I'm tired of waiting to do this God's way. You know what? The world offers me some cash and I'm going for it. And brothers and sisters, remember, that may have been his price. What is our price? It doesn't have to be greed. It could be lust, physical desire, power, position, property, influence, the right to hold my unforgiveness and grudge. If anybody deserves to not forgive, it's me. What is it that the world will offer you, that the devil will spin as a price and say, will this do it? Will this do it? Will this do it? What we know is the devil found Judas' price. Because we're told this in Luke. While he was still speaking, a crowd came up, and the man who was called Judas, one of the twelve, was leading them, and he approached Jesus to kiss him. <laughs> what a heartbreaking, powerful, emotional moment in Scripture. Don't let it go by without weighing it. <laughs> and Jesus asked him, Judas, are you betraying the Son of Man with a kiss? Judas, you're going to use our friendship as a lever to turn me in? You're going to use an expression of devotion as the moment to say, I'm turning my back on you and betraying you? Brothers and sisters, as Christians, we should become aware of the fact that we hold a unique position as Christians. Enemies of Christ can attack, they can, they can seek to destroy, they can do all kinds of damage to the kingdom. But you know what? Only friends can betray. Take a look. Found this quote. I think it's valuable. The saddest thing about betrayal is that it never comes from your enemies. It comes from your friends and your loved ones. We, the followers of Jesus Christ, committed as we are, are also in an incredible position of possible betrayal if the devil can find our price. He finds Judas's price. But oh, he's on a roll tonight, brothers and sisters. Because Luke 22 asks us to move our face from Judas for a minute and focus in now on the face of Peter. Peter, you know that guy, right? Hero of the Gospels. Walk on water, Peter. Well, he reminds me of an old kid's poem, The Little Girl with a Curl. Let me say it for you, just in case you don't recall it right away. There was a little girl who had a little curl right in the middle of her forehead. And when she was good, she was very, very good. And when she was bad, she was horrid. There you go. That's Peter. That's Peter in a nutshell. He is the only, he has the unique position in Scripture of being praised by Jesus for being totally in touch with God and being called the devil in the same chapter. Remember? Matthew 16. Go back and read it. And you'll see. He's up. He's down. I'm with you. I'm following. No, I don't know. I, we're ready. We're, I'm ready to fight for you. Up and down. And tonight... The state, because the devil is sifting, Jesus turns to Simon, the other name for Peter. And again, we've read a piece. Let's read the whole thing. Simon, Simon, Satan has asked to sift all of you as wheat. But I have prayed for you, Simon, that your faith may not fail. And when you have turned back, strengthen your brothers. And he should have said, he should have said what I should say and what you should say. Lord, I'm broken. Where? Where? How do I guard against this? I admit my weakness. I admit my tendency to fall and my brokenness. Help me! But he doesn't. He stands up and says, what? What? I got this. But he replied, Lord, I'm ready to go with you to prison and to death. And Jesus looks at him and says, Peter, you don't understand your own weakness. 
I tell you, Peter, before the rooster crows today, you will deny three times that you know me. Matthew's version shows Peter, again, let's take a look at it. Peter replied, even if all fall away on account of you, I never will. Jesus warns him with the rooster warning, right? You will disown me three times. And then Peter doubles down, folks. Doubles down. Even if I have to die with you, I will never disown you. Really? How can it be? Brothers and sisters, again, before we're too hard on Peter, how can it be that it happens in my life and your life sometimes? Am I the only one here? Again, I apologize. It's just therapy for me. <laughs> Thank you so much. Let the therapy flow. Is this only for me? I don't know. I don't think so. You see, we as Christians have a great habit of gathering together in groups and talking about how we're committed. I'm committed. I'll come through. I'll stand for you. We sing songs about it. We make declarations about it. We're going to stand with you. Yeah! And then Satan comes and says, Really? I think I can find a button. I think you, since you seem to think you got it together and you're not aware of your brokenness and your weak areas, I can find a way. He finds Peter's price that night too. Because here's what happens later on in Luke 22. Then seizing Jesus, they led him away and took him into the house of the high priest and Peter followed at a distance. And when some there had kindled a fire in the middle of the courtyard and had sat down together, Peter sat down with them. A servant girl saw him seated there in the firelight and she looked closely at him and said, this man was with him, but he denied it. Woman, I don't know him, he said. A little later, someone else saw him and said, you also were one of them. Man, I am not, Peter replied. And an hour later, another asserted, certainly this fellow was with him, for he's a Galilean. Peter replied, I don't know what you're talking about. And then the rooster crows. And in this stunning Incredible, sorry for, help, for repeating it. This is such a powerful, rich chapter. Listen to this description. Just as he was speaking, the rooster crowed, and the Lord turned and looked straight at Peter. And then Peter remembered the word the Lord had spoken to him before the rooster crows today. You will disown me three times. And he went outside and he wept bitterly. Again, before we're too hard on Peter, what's the price? For Peter, apparently, it was exposure. How many times you've been tempted? Oh, I'm willing to go to church, talk all I want to talk about, stand and committed to Jesus. But when my friends start pressuring me, what, what? Aren't you one of the... What? I don't want to be the one who gets exposed. Let somebody else stand up. I don't want to be the one who... But I thought when you were singing, you said... I tell everyone, one of the great dangers of Christian music is that many of us, not you, but Christians you know, are totally unaware of what they're saying. <laughs> Think back over the verses of some of the songs we've sung. And I wonder sometimes, I know Jesus looks at me and goes, Kephart, really? What I couldn't do with you if you actually meant that. Satan finds Peter's price. He finds Judas' price. But before we're too rough on them, look around the table again at some other faces. Matthew and James and Bartholomew and Thomas and let's take a look at the faces of the disciples. Next slide, if you would. Let's take a look at the faces of the disciples for a moment. On to that next slide, if you would. Jesus went out as usual to the Mount of Olives, and his disciples followed him. And on reaching the place, he said to them, Pray you will not fall into temptation. Okay. 
Jesus says, pray. This is rough. This is a battle. You, you realize what's happening tonight, right? The culmination of the history of the universe is coming to a point. The forces of evil are arrayed like they've never been before to stop the purposes of God. And Jesus turns to the people who he trusts, to the friends that he loves, and he says, I need you to pray. And he goes off and he prays. And when he rose from prayer, he went back to the disciples and he found them asleep. Exhausted from sorrow. Why are you sleeping? He asked them. Get up and pray so you will not fall into temptation. Brothers and sisters, when are we going to take this seriously? When are we going to live in a way that we understand what's at stake? picture that I get here is of us, those of us who have children, and we have a really important task that needs to be done because we're on our way to somewhere, something needs to get done, something needs to get accomplished, and we turn to our kid who's lying on the couch half asleep, phone lying on their chest, and we go, I need you to do this, and they roll over and they give you that, I'm too tired. You know what that really means? I don't want to. I wonder how many times I've stood in services and celebrations, sung songs, made statements, and Jesus with love leans over my shoulder and says, have you counted the cost of this, Jeff? Have you really counted the cost? Have you thought of what you're saying? Listen, to this. this is an incredible statement right here. Next one, if you would. This is from Matthew. Then Jesus told them this very night, this is at the dinner again, you will all fall away on account of me, for it's written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. I want to hear this. I want you to hear this. But Peter declared, even if I have to die with you, I will never disown you. Yeah, that Peter sticking his neck out, open mouth, insert foot. Peter, but wait. And all the other disciples said the same. And by the end of the evening, Satan had found their prize. Now you say, Jeff, I'm so glad I came today because this is such an encouraging message. <laughs> Thank you so much for the incredible encouragement that's just flowing over me. Brothers and sisters, you have to come to grips with what is unfolding around this fellowship meal. But I've got great news for you. Here's the good news, the encouraging piece in the middle of all of this. Next slide, if you would. The stunning fact is Jesus knew what all of them would do and what you and I would do, but he would die for us anyway. You get, get your heart around that. When he gathers them around this table and he has this meal with them, he does it knowing they are going to betray him. knowing they are going to turn their backs, knowing they are going to choose to walk away under pressure, and he still follows through on the meal, and he still follows through on his commitment to them. Brothers and sisters, when the devil whispers to you, you know, if Jesus knew the way you would do broken things and the way you would make choices, he'd have never picked you. You take him to Luke 22 and say he picked them. And he stayed committed to them. Jesus never looks at you and goes, ha, huh, I picked you, look at you. Should never. Should ne what angel was on the job the night you got in? I'm going to fire them. Because the crazy thing about Luke chapter 22 is in the middle of all this betrayal, this slide, if you would take it. You see, at just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though for a good person, someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for me, for you, for us in this, knowing 
knowing while you were still sinners, knowing everything you would do, he died anyway. Next one. On a night of broken commitments, Jesus would keep his. On a night of broken commitments, Jesus would keep his commitment to the Father and to us. Watch him as he goes out into the Garden of Gethsemane. Brothers and sisters, the devil's sifting him too. Remember the first time he's tempted? Back at the beginning of the Gospels, it says, and then the devil left him when? Until an opportune time. The devil was doing the same thing with him. What's your price, Jesus? What's your price, Jesus? You know these guys aren't going to stick with you. You know these guys aren't going to stay with you. Why do you have to do this? Why would you consider them to be worthy? Really? Love has its limits. Why don't you back off now and walk away while there's still time? No one would blame you. And he's having this wrestling match. 100% human as well as 100% God. Hear me carefully. Not sinful like us, Scripture says that, but he was just as we are yet without sin. In his 100% humanness, I want you to see him wrestle as Satan seeks to get him to turn away. Jesus went out as usual to the Mount of Olives. His disciples followed him. On reaching that place, he said to them, pray you will not fall into temptation. And he withdrew about a stone's throw beyond them, knelt down and prayed in one of the most beautifully honest, open, heartbreaking moments. Father, if you are willing, take this cup from me. Can I dare try to translate this into something? This is not fun. This hurts. I realize I don't have to, but, but follow, follow. Look at this next word. One of the most powerful three three letter conjunctions in all of the Bible. Yet. Yet not my will but yours be done. They may not keep their commitments to me and they may not keep their commitments to you, Father, but I will com keep my commitment to them and I will keep my commitment to you. The next slide, one of the things we need to see in that very night, the, he gets arrested, right? <laughs> I, I love the picture. Simon, Mr. Little Girl with a Curl, pulls a sword. You know, he's a fisherman. Filet knives are more his, his way, right? Pulls a sword. <laughs> Takes off an ear of a servant, right? Whoa, hasn't practiced much apparently. Jesus stops all of it. Says, Wait a minute. Listen to this, folks. This is what you need to know. Do you think I cannot call on my Father and He will at once put at my disposal more than 12 legions of angels? Do you understand the implications of that? He understood. He had the big red escape button. He had it. And He had the right to use it. If at any time He would have said so, I'm done with this. He could have hit the big red escape button. Legions of angels show up. It's over. He didn't have to do this. But you know why he did? Because he saw me. And he saw you. And he knew there would be no other way. And he loved us so much. I want them home. I love how he says it in Matthew. But then how would the scriptures be fulfilled that say it must happen this way? This is the only way. I will keep my commitment to them. Regardless of the cost. So let's go back to the table for a moment. The picture, the center of the meal, center of the chapter. Back at the table, listen to Jesus speak. When the hour came, Jesus and his apostles reclined at table. Judas is there, folks. Peter's there. All those disciples are there. They're going to wander away. They're going to betray him in various ways. And he said to them, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it again until it finds fulfillment in the kingdom of God. Listen. And he took bread, gave thanks, and broke it, and gave it to them, saying, This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. 
And in the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. And in so doing, he institutes that thing we call communion, that thing that we do on a weekly basis, or at least it is offered to us. You see, baptism is the one-time initiation moment. It is the commitment moment where everyone declares to the whole world, I am in with Jesus. I am in, and I don't care who knows. Communion is the commitment renewing moment where I say, I'm still in. I'm still in. I freshly commit. Now here's the interesting thing. Why would Jesus choose symbols of death to be his fresh commitment moment? Why would he say to his people, what I want you to do in order to declare your fresh commitment to me is to use the symbols of my broken body and shed blood? Answer, because I want you to do this in remembrance of me. I want you to remember that I am committed to you. 100% to the death. So where are you? I'm committed to you. And I want you to understand that because I am committed to you, you can count on my grace. Another one. Do this in remembrance of me. My commitment with you is to the death so you can trust my grace. You can trust that I know the brokenness. I know the pain. I know your capability of betraying. I know the fact that you're weak. I understand the struggles that you have. And I picked you anyway. And I died for you. Trust my grace. Trust my forgiveness. Fall on that grace. Don't play games. Be honest. Be open. Share the truth. Share the struggles. And then, as you share honestly with me, you can feel safe and free to say, I'm committed again. I'm still in. Because I know you're always in for me. And I trust that the one who would die for me is also the one who forgives. It's also the one who sets me free. So let's do some summary thoughts. The devil still sifts looking for our price. So we must live aware of our weakness and continue to surrender it to Jesus. It is a woeful thing, brothers and sisters, for me, and then I'll put it on for you and for any other Christians, if we do not live constantly surrendering our weak areas to Jesus Christ and being aware of what they are. I am stunned, not you, but Christians you know, how many Christians have no idea they walk around like Peter going, oh, I'm good. I'm good. You can count on me. And then the devil goes, when I push this button, watch what happens. When I say this price, this is what, do you understand where your weak areas are? Do you understand where your brokenness is? Have you asked Jesus to reveal it to you and have you shared it? Share it? Why people will find out there is nobody who's got it together. And to the extent that you believe you do, you set yourself up like Peter for disaster. The devil's always looking to find what your price is. And so you've got to live aware of your weakness and continue to surrender to Jesus. Remember what he told the disciples in the Garden of Gethsemane? Pray that you not fall into temptation. Wait, echo, echo, echo. Lord's Prayer. Here it is. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Lord, i got to get honest and open before you. Here's where I, I struggle. And Lord, I pray that if there's any way possible today, don't take me by my fall and weak areas. Why do we pray that? So, that? so that we're aware. And then we say, but deliver us. And I love this. It's not deliver us from choosing those bad things. It's deliver us from who is always sifting. But brothers and sisters, for those of us who know what it means to sit at the table and have Judas moments and Peter moments and disciple moments, this next summary thought, Jesus' grace is sufficient in our weakness. He knows our brokenness and he has provided forgiveness if we are willing to choose it. This is the joy, the amazing hope of the Christian life. It's not that somehow we become better people. It's that Jesus 
takes our lives and hides us with him. That's what Colossians says, right? We die with him and we're buried with him. And when he returns, we'll return with him. He is able to forgive. I love this passage from John chapter, or 1 John, chapters 1 and 2, because it sounds for all the world for a little bit like John is schizophrenic. I want you to watch this. This is the same passage. There this a set of verses that actually come in order. You ready? If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. By the way, he's talking to Christians. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves. Don't you be foolish. Don't you go out there and, and not recognize that your weakness is a dangerous place and that the devil is sifting you. Don't, don't lean into the left hook of sin. Fight back. Okay, I got that. But listen to this. Pendulum swings all the way to the other side in the very next statement. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. Listen, how much unrighteousness? There is the joy, right? Even though we're broken, if we choose to sin, if we're honest, if we come to Jesus and we confess and we say, I have blown it. I have been broken. Forgive me. He forgives us from, oh, the grace that is greater than all our sin. Listen, if we claim we have not sinned, we make him out to be a liar and our word is not in us. Wow, okay, I realize I'm a broken sinner and I need to remember that. But listen to the next verse. Pendulum swings all the way back. Like I said, it sounds almost like he's a little bit schizophrenic. My dear children, I write this to you so that you will not sin. Okay, which one is it, John? Am I supposed to like be strong and, 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 and never fall? Or is it that I'm always broken and that I always need to be falling on the grace of Jesus? John says, yes. Yes, you got it. That's it. You're supposed to be aware and fight to not sin. But if you do, run to the grace that is proven by a Jesus who dies knowing your brokenness. But if anybody does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. He's the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not only for ours, but also for the sins of the world. Don't sin, but if you do, trust the grace. But don't sin, but if you do, trust the grace, because victory is available. Last statement. I want to say this before I say this. The contrast between Judas and Peter is at this place. Judas is a broken, betraying mess by the end of Luke 22. And Peter is a broken, betraying mess by the end of Luke 22. But Judas, when he finds out and deals with his fall, is going to take the burden on himself. He's going to blame himself. He's going to refuse to trust in the Jesus who would love him enough to accept his brokenness. And he's going to go out. He's going to take matters into his own hands. He's going to finally get to him. And he's going to end his own life. And he's lost. Peter takes his brokenness. And Jesus comes looking for him, you remember? At the end of John, he says, Do you love me? Do you love me? Do you love me? And Peter just simply goes, You know I love you, but you know I'm a broken mess. And Jesus says, Yeah, but I died for that mess, and if you're willing to return, I can use you. And he goes on to become a hero of the faith. What's the difference? Peter trusted the grace. Judas did not. As we share communion, you get an opportunity to declare your commitment to him and be freshly amazed at his commitment to you. Look at what scripture says about when we take communion. So then whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and blood of the Lord. Everyone ought to examine themselves before they eat of the bread and drink from the cup. For those who eat and drink without discerning the body of Christ, eat and drink judgment on themselves. <laughs> Whoa, that's heavy. Okay, what Paul's basically saying is don't underestimate the power of the commitment you're making, nor should you ever underestimate the amount of power and grace that is in the commitment that has been made to you. So what do we examine ourselves for? Do you understand what your price is? 
Do you understand why the devil's sifting you? Are there any places in your life where you and he have already made a deal? And you need to fall at the feet of Jesus and confess and come in the eyes, in the face of these beautiful symbols. How much do I love you? This much, Jesus says. And he stretches out his arms and he dies. And he says, come to me and I can deal with that. You can't handle it yourself, but I will receive your brokenness and you can walk away from a communion table saying, I'm still in. By the grace of Jesus Christ, I am free, I am forgiven, and I am still in. But are you willing to examine yourself? Where are you today at that table? What's your price? Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, I am amazed at these two absolutely true principles that are laid out in Luke 22. I am broken. And if I let the devil win and make deals in my life, I am capable of great betrayal. But you are faithful. Faithful to the death. And knowing my brokenness, you died to provide an answer. A continuing answer. An answer that is available anytime I'm willing to be honest and open with you and confess my sin. You are faithful and just and you'll forgive it. And Lord, we're going to have an opportunity in just a moment to make that commitment declaration. I'm committed Lord, you know where the battles are, where the struggles are. I pray that today we could fall at the feet of the one who calls us to the table and invites us into the grace and freshly say, forgive me. Help me overcome my weaknesses. But I declare as I make that commitment that I'm still in this with you. Amen.